So, let's start with this wonderful panel. Very happy to have them here. We've got, to my right, Paul Mason, noted author, esteemed journalist, and I think one of the most important voices on technology and politics in the Anglophone world right now. Uh, to his right, we have David Harvey. You know. We have David Harvey, Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Geography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and author of his new book. Do you have a copy on you, David? No, no, no. Valentina? <laughs> Valentina, do you have a copy on you? No. You got a new copy? Look at this gentleman here. It's a very fetching uh, green and red jacket. <laughs> David is very happy to sign them, I believe, after the event. Are you? Yeah, yeah great. <laughs> David's very happy to, here we go. It's a very good book. Mark's cap on the madness of economic reason. And um, somebody jokingly said, has David read anything but capital for the last 20 years? I mean, I mean that's a good question. But <laughs> in this book, in this book, no, no, no. In this book, you'll be absolutely shocked because there's capital one, two, and three, and the Grunrisse. So, <laughs> revelatory. Um, in 220 pages. In 220 pages. Really excellent book and some really important new stuff in his, uh, in his work. Then to my left, I have Alice Bell, who is a co-director and the head of communications at 1010. Is that right? Alice has a, you have a PhD in the history of science, don't you? Science communication. Oh. And um, we did a podcast a few years ago on climate change, and I think that podcast opened my eyes as to just how critical climate change is in uh, any transition of capitalism, something we'll really address uh, as this evening proceeds. And to the left of Alice, we have James Medway. Uh, James is the political advisor to John McDonald, is that correct? And the former, the former chief economist or senior economist at the New Economics, chief economist at the New Economics Foundation. So I'll start with a blurb from, uh, from the TWT website for this evening. Since the inventions of agriculture and writing, technology has endured an intimate relationship with politics, serving to both disrupt and uphold concentrations of power. But do the technologies of the new century, from computing to synthetic biology, create a new set of possibilities? Are they the bridge to a different kind of society? Now, I'll start with you, Paul. That fundamentally seems to me to be the hypothesis underlying your book, Post-Capitalism. Uh, in your vision of post-capitalism, what is the relationship between technology and politics? Well, uh, thank you. Um, let me just try and explain what I mean by post-capitalism. Um, in one of the books that uh, Aaron just mentioned, the Grundrisse, uh, Marx's 1858 notebook that he used to try and work on capital, um, there is a, a passage which when people discovered it, because this thing was lost for a long time, were quite shocked. Many people of my age went to university uh, in a, in a crisis-ridden era, 1970s and 80s, and they saw the profit margins of, of capitalist companies collapsing. They saw the business model of capitalism, the model, Keynesianism, uh, failing, and they kind of assumed that this would uh, be the end. And, and we weren't the first, because it, the same illusion was there in the 1930s and in, indeed in the, in, the, in, in the 1890s. Every generation of radicals has had this moment where capitalism looks uh, finished and isn't. And of course, technology explains, is one of the explanations, and it's in there in Marxist capital, as to why. Because it, technology... Uh, allows various escape routes from crisis. You can cheapen what it costs to create a worker. You can cheapen what it costs to create a machine. And these things in Marxist capital that, that are referred to as the counteracting tendencies to the fundamental tendency, which is the rate, the, the, the rate of profit shrinking, are form kind of, to me, permanent escape mechanisms until a kind of technology comes along that cheapens machines and labor and goods faster than, it, than they can create expensive ones. And it eradicates labor out of the workforce faster than new jobs can be created. So 100 years ago, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, the, uh, the noted Marxist revolutionary, that she, was the te she, was, she did this job. She was the head teacher of the German Labor Party's school. Uh, she wrote, capitalism is about to reach the limits of the, the new markets it can find. And in the time it took her to write the book, uh, The Accumulation of Capital, uh, the number of movie theatres in Berlin went from one to 168. 
So capitalism did find a new market, and it did create a new, more expensive product. My thesis is that information technology is different. The, it's not mystically different. It doesn't create abstract, mystical cyber things. It just cheapens real things so rapidly that it disrupts capitalism's normal mechanism of adaptation and survival. And so what does it mean going forward for us? I mean, I hope we'll talk on, uh, about Uber, etc. Let's, let's keep it at the abstract level now. Mm. It, it means that we have to deal as a radical social democratic party, which is what I hope Labour will become, with a situation where our utopia for 200 years, as for Marx, was based on work. But we might have to change that. We have to come up with utopias that are no longer based on work because work isn't going to be ne necessary for our great-grandchildren. And in addition, we've kind of seen, you know, a lot of us call ourselves socialists, and in its technical sense, socialism is, is the, man the management of scarcity to, to in the favour of poor people, in favour of social justice. Uh, you have to plan, you have to nationalise, you have to, you have to uh, take control. Uh, of various means of production. But I think we will also be facing the problem of communism. That is, the problem of certain things being so easy and cheap to produce that be, they become abundant before we even get there. So that's the, the outline of my basic set of ideas. OK. Um, I'm going to stick with you for a second. Is it fair to say, quite briefly, are you a technological determinist? Um, I'm more of a one than probably other people on this platform, but nobody should be a technological determinist in the sense that one, te you know, the, the certain kind of technology produces a certain kind of ideas and a certain kind of society. However, I think we're living through a very big inflection point in technology, mm -hmm. and, to, and, and to this extent, technology, it's not just that it created the Arab Spring or that it created the Occupy movement and that it created new networked ways of thinking and interacting, but that the way network technology is interacting with the human brain and psyche and that old thing, human nature, seems to be very interesting in, in that, that it is creating people with multiple selves, people with multiple channels of expression into society, whereas, and here again, you know, for, for those of us who study politics, you know, we, probably most people in this room, have, if you've been to any university and anywhere near a politics department, the subject of politics is the individual, this kind of person with rights uh, created for, by 250 years of, of bourgeois society. I see that fragmenting. I see people able to manage their selves in a way that they can accept different amounts of rights. And that's both terrifying and interesting to me. Okay. Um, sticking with the idea of technological determinism, I'm going to come to you, David. You say in this book, as you've said previously on your very eminent lectures on capital, that technology should be understood as just one moment within a broader constellation of change, and that history proceeds through these moments, which are all in tension with one another. Can you just outline those moments and how you understand social transformation unfolding through them? Yeah, I, I used uh, this uh, footnote in Marx's Capital, which talked about the way in which uh, technology reveals or discloses the relation to nature, the social relations which we produce, the manner of production, uh, the you know the whole set of set of things. Um, and I always dwell on the fact that you know reveals or discloses is not determined. And that therefore you have to look at the way in which uh, technology is embedded in other forms of social relations and the like. But I also uh, took seriously the organisation that Marx laid out in Capital, where in fact the chapter on technology and uh, the machine system and all the rest of it comes at the end of the transition from feudalism, not at the beginning that uh, a chapter on cooperation and then divisions of labor and detailed divisions of labor it says that capital was being erected on a technological foundation of a certain sort, but it was capital was being erected on it. 
Uh, and then in the chapter on machinery, he kind of says, well, finally, uh, capital found its real, its, its own technological base, but it was the last thing it found. And in the process of finding it, it, it you, when you're reading that chapter, you see that he talks about the way in which mental conceptions of the world had to change. That nature could no longer be looked upon as some, something organic and alive. It had to be turned into a dead object that could be exploited. That uh, art was displaced by, by science and technology. You see all these transitions in the chapter. And, and, and actually you see that, that, that all of those elements at work in, 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 in the chapter. And the other thing he kind of points out is that we can misread situations if we concentrate merely on the technology. He opens the chapter, for example, by saying, you know, John Stuart Mill uh, expressed uh, considerable consternation and, and, pu and was puzzled by the fact that uh, new technologies and machines which are supposed to load, lighten the load of labor end up making the lot of the laborer worse. And John Stuart Mill says, this is very perplexing. And Marx kind of says, well, it's not perplexing at all because the technology's use by capital is to extract more value from labor and to squeeze the laborer even more than before. And this is one of the things you see historically, that every time a new wave of technology comes along, it does indeed seem to suggest some beautiful you know, new future that can be constructed out of it. And uh, so we see that in the 1960s, we saw it in the 19th century, you see it uh, in the 19, uh, eight, you know, 1990s with the internet and all this sort of stuff. You, so you see it again and again and people kind of say, well, you know, this is, the, this, this is the basis for a socialist society. The answer is, well, it could be, but it's not going to be because the capitalist social relations are dominant. And all time the capitalist social relations are dominant and the class domination is there, they are going to make sure that, that these new technologies get used to squeeze value out of labor, to squeeze the, pop the population, uh, to steal uh, as well from the population as much as they can. So the technology becomes, instead of a vehicle for emancipation, it becomes a vehicle for greater and greater levels of oppression. And we see that with things like the internet, we see it with uh, all of the kind of uh, surveillance articles that are around, and the NSA and all the other stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this technology, which was being sort of looked on as somehow or other liberatory, is now being turned into a kind of a real, real tough uh, system of, uh, of oppression. But that's because of the domination of the class relation. Mm. I think... I'm just gonna so I'm gonna so I'm gonna sort of say, look, if there is something fundamental we've got to really look at, it's the the nature of the class relation in contemporary society and what it's likely to do with the new intelligence. And we I hope we get into this, particularly artificial intelligence, because mm -hmm. there's something we need to discuss and debate about then right now. I'm sticking on this topic just initially. Okay, we will have a very round discussion. We've already discussed this as a panel. Um, you specifically take umbrage with. Paul's concept of post-capitalism. Now, as I understand it from what you have both already said, is that Paul essentially inverts what Marx is outlining in Capital. So you're saying that the institutional structures are there, wage labour, the, wa wa the proletariat's there in Elizabethan England, a bunch of things are there, the social relations are there, relationship to nature, and then finally capitalism creates technologies. Paul, with post-capitalism, I think you're inverting that. I'm not, nobody's saying it's wrong or right, but your thesis fundamentally is that we have these disruptive technologies and gradually the social relations, relationship to nature, et cetera, will, will overlap on them. Is, is that fair, Paul, or not? I, I wouldn't frame it like that because everything you just said about, about technologically, technology as a mediator of social relations, I also agree with. But what it, the, the transition... So, so the transition, however, I envisage beyond capitalism is one in which... The relation, to use Marxist terminology, hopefully we're not excluding two thirds of the room, the, the relations of production, the social relations that we all live within, can't tolerate for, for any great length of time a situation where the technology is producing abundance, one, and what Marx talks about in the Grundrisse, which is social knowledge. He, Marx says, as soon as knowledge becomes social and embodied in the general intellect, it will blow the, the foundations of capitalism sky high. Not the superstructure, the foundations. And that's what I, be I believe that's the transition we're in, not the one I believed 30 years ago as a student studying 
capital, which was profit collapses, economic crisis, long period of scarcity. Okay, so we're going to move on. I'm going to come to Alice. We're talking about the issue of, obviously, climate change is one of the fundamental crises of the 21st century. I'd put it alongside probably ageing, the collapse of our economic system, resource scarcity. The green left for decades, at least that's my interpretation, has viewed any transition beyond fossil fuels, i.e. to solar, to wind, and so on, as necessarily having to mean that we consume less energy. Um, is that a fair summation, and uh, is that correct in your view? In terms of whether it's fair, um, I think we should remember that the green movement is, has, is currently and has always been very diverse. So there is a thread of green thought that would advocate that sort of point of view. But there's always been many other types of green thought, and they've often argued, against, argued with each other. And they have different views about different types of technologies and notions of abundance or scarcity or all sorts of other words we might bring along with that. Um, so I, I mean, I guess we could say right, a bit of it's true whether it's a good idea or not. Um, it's easy to see a kind of message from Greens as like, use less, we just need to stop oh, living the small way... Small is beautiful. Small, small is beautiful, actually, that's another way of putting it, yeah. Um, and I think that probably works in some contexts and not in others. So I don't want to... I mean, I would, I would say that one of the things that we need to do to tackle climate change is build more forms of other types of energy and switch where we're getting our energy from. So it's not just about not having fossil fuels, it's about moving from fossil fuels to wind or solar. And has everyone seen the massive big offshore wind turbines on the beach now? Last time I came to Brighton, that wasn't the view. Um, we're seeing these things shifting already. But on top of that, energy efficiency is an important thing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we all need to be cold. It means actually that we can be warm. It means that along with these big shiny wind turbines and solar panels and bits of new kit that people seem to get very excited about, we should also be getting really excited about loft insulation. <laughs> Seriously, it's really I keep trying to tell people that we shouldn't say loft insulation is boring because that just makes it more boring. It is, it's, you know, it's, important. it's really important as well. And it's an example of how uh, green action can intersect quite strongly with all sorts of other forms of activism, particularly like housing rights. So um, at the moment, um, one of the things that happened in the coalition government was we got a new law that meant that landlords had to make their, the houses that they were renting out couldn't be the lowest energy efficiency. Basically, like one public health person I spoke to said, would be like living in a sieve if you lived in a house that's like D or E rated. So if you were renting out a home, you would have to make some very basic changes to it, kind of, to stop it from being completely leaky, um, which would affect, which has an impact on climate change. It will save energy, but it also means that people live in more comfortable homes. Now, this policy is now been screwed around loads. Uh, sorry, am I allowed to say that word? Yeah. All right, I'm not sure. If so we're, you're Facebook not, isn't regulated by That's why you're on Facebook. <laughs> you can use all sorts of words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, th this is an example of if we're fighting for uh, movement to save energy, actually it can be done in a way that we are making homes more comfortable, that we are asking for renters' rights, um, that we are building better buildings that last longer. It's not necessarily about having less of something, it's about having better stuff. Um, so I just I, I worry a bit when we have this dichotomy about a sort of green saying small is beautiful and less is more and like a sort of other movement which is like yay warmth abundance great stuff and you're like well we can have both and it's just about looking at where we're going to be play, using our technologies efficiently. Yeah. So I mean, for me, my view of the green left historically is that that's been the tendency. I think that's probably going, but that's been the historic tendency. And I, the question I'd ask as a result would be, do you think that the historic mistake of the green movement in the last thirty years is an inability? to generate a populist politics around actually saying, look, your lives could be better beyond fossil fuels. Here's why. Rather than saying, well, actually, you're going to have to be very restrained, be very austere. You can only eat food in season from 50 miles away, which in England is not great. You know, yeah. uh, do you think that's, that's been a, a political failure of the Green Left? Uh, possibly, yes. And I'd say that alongside that, we've also got kind of messages about climate change being just that we're all going to die. And I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat this we're all going to die. Um, <laughs> but that's the jokey way of putting it. It's hard to not be really crass when you talk about climate change because it's really, really bad. Um, really, really bad. And I don't, I don't want to say that... What I'm about to advocate is that we also need to be able to give people a positive vision of the future. And there's a danger there because you, you sound like you're saying it's all going to be OK. Uh, but we need something to motivate us, to go alongside, alongside appreciating how awful it is. This is not to say we're giving you some hope and that's all you're going to look at. 
it is awful, but there is some light. There is ways that we can tackle it and we can make it less awful. And there are new, thing, new ways that we can rebuild the world as we are rebuilding it to tackle climate change that will also make the world better for other reasons, like energy democracy, like clean air, like all sorts of other things that tackling climate change we will also be able to tackle. Um, and so I think, that there's, I think you're right to say that they haven't been able to give a positive vision, but it's not necessarily just been uh, about saying we all need to, to eat potatoes. Final question. Um, would a post-capitalist society necessarily have to transition to renewables? Um, I suppose it depends on what you want that to look like. I think any society, if you want society to exist, if you want people to live on this planet, we're going to have to stop using fossil fuels last week. Right, so, so yeah. yeah, how... <laughs> okay. James? Let's get this mic over here. Huh? So we've talked on the level of theory, we've discussed economy, technology, climate, and then we've got the, the policy wonk. Uh, one of the sort of, you know... <laughs> sorry. Hey, James, James is a PhD in economics. He's very happy to be called a wonk. Sure. No, no, no. Uh, you know. Um, one of the sort of, uh, the, the sort of hallmark policies of uh, the Labour manifesto was the idea of national investment banks. Yeah. What would the role of a national investment bank be within what Paul's calling radical social democracy? What kinds of things could it do? There's, there's two bits. I think it fits in, hopefully, with, with what Paul and David and, and Alice had talked about, which is uh, two parts of this. One of them is, I and mean, this is striking, and it's probably obvious to people in this room, it's obvious you just walk out the door, um, particularly since the, the recession and the crash, is that for all the talk of this big technological shift that's taking place, the, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, or whatever you want, want to call it, the kinds of technologies that, that, that Paul has been talking about, uh, and the acceleration of technological change that implies, what's actually happened very, very clearly since 2008, and accelerating, as you might expect, since 2010, is that we've substituted, we've substituted cheap labour for, for investment in any of this new technology or capital on, on any particular scale, like very, very strikingly so. So instead of, we basically have a, a kind of an economy that works towards, because the incentives are set out like this, and the labour market works like this, and your institutions think like this, that works towards saying, well, we could invest in new technology, we could make other things happen. We could, for instance, if you're talking about investment in renewables, this is a relatively quick way to, to generate some highly skilled, uh, well-paid, relatively secure jobs and do something that would get you some distance towards meeting any kind of climate change objectives. You could do something like that. In fact, all your incentives are to say, well, actually, we don't do that because we can just effectively cut people's wages, mess around with their hours, put them on zero-hour contracts and do all of these things instead. So one of the things in the manifesto, uh, and, and probably building on this going ahead, is that the, the fundamental bit we have to get hold of is how investment happens and where it goes. We need more investment in this sort of technology on a very, very large scale. And, the, and it's embarrassing, some of it. If you see, you know, we can sit here and talk <laughs> about digital technologies, about uh, what we can do online, the rest of it. I mean, just wandering around Brighton, the broadband drops, right, in your, on your mobile phone, that sort of thing, that you pay a fortune for these things for, from these companies. It doesn't work across uh, great swathes of the country, that sort of thing. And you talk about, oh, there's this big new world we could be part of. As an economy, where we live is lagging behind in all these things and starting to seriously lag behind. So one part of what you have to do, and if you want a positive vision of this, there's like you have to solve a problem that this government in particular, in the British economy in a more fundamental sense, isn't really solving itself, which is that if you want some of these things to happen, there has to be a way, there has to be the institutions that will deliver that investment. So that's why you say a national investment bank and regional development banks. That's one part of it. The other part of it, I think, is, is exactly what Alice said, which is this question of energy democracy and democratizing the ownership of the technology that's there. Now, I don't know. I mean, it's exactly the same thing. Last time I came to Brighton, there wasn't a great big new wind farm uh, on the horizon. Uh, and now there is. And this is good in and of itself. It's better than that not happening. I won't speculate on who owns it, but my guess is this isn't you know, some sort of local cooperative. Uh, if anybody's from Brighton can tell me otherwise, right? They can, yeah, so they can tell me that this isn't going to be some sort of locally owned. German government. There you go, the German government. Right. I'm, I'm impressed at the depth of knowledge and local knowledge uh, on this particular subject. Yeah, it's good. It's the general interest. It's, it's back to the Grundrisse. Um, so it's not owned 
locally. It's not controlled locally. Now, that's less of a problem for offshore in practice. There are issues around, you know, kind of the ownership of the skyline, if you like, and the sea underneath and the, and the coast and that sort of thing. It's more of a problem you're talking about onshore wind, which is where the really big, obvious economic win is, just in terms of this stuff is now really cheap, about as cheap as gas. It will get cheaper to install. And if you want to make a very rapid transition to low carbon energy production, this is one of the, the routes to do it. Now, the issue there, of course, is that if you don't own the wind farm yourself that's now sitting on top of what was otherwise an unspoiled bit of landscape, because lo and behold, this is where the wind tends to be, you won't feel too pleased about that. But you'll feel very differently if you own that and your community owns that and you collectively own that. That would change how you feel about this. It would also generate incomes. It would also start to introduce some economic activity locally. So there's two parts, I think, to this. One is there's the big national collective effort that has to be made to try and knock the economy we're in into somewhere that isn't basically low investment and crap jobs forevermore, because that's the downward spiral that we're starting to look at. That's the big national part of it. The other part is the democratization and ownership of that economy, giving people the chance to actually take some parts of the wealth that's there and use it for themselves and use it in a way that's you know collective and fair and democratic and all the rest. I just wanted to echo that, particularly on onshore wind. I completely agree with it, but I would disagree and say that it does matter on offshore wind too. And there was a really interesting paper from the Labour Energy Forum just out last week. Um, I would recommend that you Google and try and find it um, on this very issue, on the ownership of UK offshore wind. And all, what's useful about it, it doesn't just put some data on it, it gives some really good arguments about why that matters and why we shouldn't just say... Community energy is for little projects in solar farms mm. or small wind, far wind turbine, of which there are several, actually. Sussex, Brighton is a really good hub, particularly community solar. Uh, but we could have community wind, they offshore wind. They have community offshore wind in Denmark. Why couldn't we have it here? And I think we'll see people locally who probably are thinking, oh, my view's changed. I used to live in Brighton. It was a bit of an emotional shock for me to see the view being changed today when I came down here. I quite liked it because I like wind turbines, but at the same time, I can imagine people looking over and going, that's owned by a German bank, that's not really us. And if there was ownership, and also it affects our public engagement with renewable energy, but also it means that our supply chains are going to be in the UK and it's going to mean that we have more jobs here. It has all sorts of economic impacts. So yeah, let's not you. lose the opportunity of offshore wind at all. James, I'm not, you can say what you like, but I'm just going to ask you a quick question. Cool. Um, Collectively owned forms of renewable, renewable energy locally, be it solar or wind, is that the kind of investment that a national investment bank would be making? Well, that, that would be the source. I mean, look, the, the principal barrier, and I think Alice is absolutely right in this, there's no reason why you can't do this at scale, and you have to do it at a fairly large scale if you're doing offshore wind, uh, ideally. And other, you can think of other big sort of renewable projects that, that would look like that. The issue here, to get back to, to what other people were talking about, is that we do not have a financial system that is particularly well geared to saying, hey, we're going to provide the finance, the capital, necessary for your local community or your bigger than your local community, your town, your city, to actually set up something like this. These are the barriers. This is a real barrier to, to getting these things up and running in this country, which is partly why, and that's probably mostly why, uh, the scale so far has tended to be more limited for, for community projects. Now, there are local councils and local authorities trying to get into doing this, to, to setting up their own sort of wind farms, to making these things happen. But the big barrier there is that if you don't have a financial system that can deliver the investment to do this, that will give people the capital that understands what a cooperative might be or what a collective form of ownership might be of something like a, a wind farm, then you won't get the money to do it. And if you don't get the money to do it, it won't happen. So you have to think about building new institutions that can start to, to deliver this sort of thing. And of course, then, once you've got that, you can talk about scaling up, I think. So, Alice, very quickly, then I'm going to pull. Just uh, to give people a concrete example of this, this idea of people owning their own solar farms and wind farms and stuff isn't some imaginary thing that happens in the future. It has happened in the last several decades in the UK. And I've got a really nice example of one that happened just locally recently. The town of Balkan, which you might have known for its anti-fracking protests, the first place where we really saw anti-fracking uh, protests happening in the UK. After all the protesters went and the frackers went, they decided not to frack, the local community felt kind of bruised by the experience and was sort of left with this thought, well, how should we power ourselves? And they decided what they wanted was community-owned solar. They wanted to own it themselves, not have fracking companies running, like, floating in. And they wanted it to be solar. And they tried to build a community-owned solar farm. And there is a beautiful solar farm in Balkan that produces enough electricity to power Balkan and the village next door. But because of the changes in policy and how difficult it is to run a, 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 an energy co-op in the UK now, it had to end up being commercially run. And you can go and see it. It's beautiful. It's designed really well because it was designed with the community because right up into the stage they were about to you know, plug it in, it was going to be community-owned. 
but in the end it couldn't be. Uh, and that was a few years ago. This isn't some imaginary thing in the future. This is actually our history, and it could still be our present and our future too if we just had some small changes in policy. Mm. Paul, uh, to transition to post-capitalism, would we need to completely socialise finance, or would an institution like national investment banks be sufficient? Um, wh what I think is, let's take the example of energy, because... Um, the or not just energy, of decarbonising, okay? Because as well as energy, there's circularity. That is, designing, uh, designing products so that they never extract any more raw materials from the world ever again. That is possible. Ellen MacArthur, perfectly capitalist and liberal person, has, has done a lot of work with corporations about how you do this. So if you think about the two things, decarbonising energy production and circularising the production of things, I, these are two important building blocks for, you know, let's be clear, what I want to do is to transition, beyond, not just beyond the carbon world, but beyond the world dominated by, by market forces. That's what the, the socialist or communist project or post-capitalist project is. Now, what, what, what do we do concretely? I think the first thing is, obviously, you, you turn off the, the most important thing, the most important element of neoliberalism is the neo bit, the one that all the 1930s thinkers were, were obsessed with. You must continually, every morning, recreate the market because it doesn't recreate itself. You have a privatisation machine. Yeah. Quickly, for the audience, what's neoliberalism and what's the difference between it and liberalism? Very well, quickly. Well, I, because, I, well, no, because uh, well, okay. it's a key term. We should never shy away from using this term. For me, I describe an, an object, it's the, it's the system we live in. But the theory of it is, liberalism, liberalism is laissez-faire. The state stands above the market and the market interacts and it, and it reaches equilibrium itself. The theorists of neoliberalism in the 1930s, Hayek and a guy called Fougier in France, France said, it, look, the market doesn't recreate itself. Left to itself, it produces monopolies and states. Uh, and the state takes over. So we must forever use the state to coercively reinsert private sector values into the economy. So the first thing we do, to come back to the argument, is switch off the privatisation machine. We switch off the, 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 the constant incentive, what, what you just described, uh, to, for a, a community-run thing to go private into the commercial sector. But here's the thing. In general, what, I've dis what I would like to see are small-scale, diverse projects of, no of non-profit nature, whether they're co-ops, whether they're uh, credit unions, whether they are uh, small worker, worker co-op-owned uh, factories, etc. But I make an exception on energy because when it, when it comes to this big transition we have to make beyond carbon, the weirdest thing is the, 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 the neoliberal elite told us that you know, four billion year old planet, uh, a 25 year old system is the solution to saving it, i.e. the free market. It, we don't necessarily think that that is true, but the horrible truth might be something akin to Stalinism is the only thing that will rapidly take control and decarbonize. I, 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 no, I don't like that either. Uh, but, but one has to begin from the technology. Uh, we need big decarbonized energy systems which don't make any profit and that sink into the ground this four trillion of market capitalization, i.e. the shares of energy companies are worth four trillion and if they produce all the energy, the planet burns a lot quicker than any of us imagine. So I think state ownership and intervention into the energy thing, energy system is for me the most important, or rather the most radical bit of what I want to do. The rest can be done through a mixture of market, non-market, and state. But do we need to socialise finance in so much as the incentives right now are completely misaligned? Well, see, socialised finance is important, isn't it? But it doesn't necessarily mean nationalised. Finance is essentially, all in Britain anyway, partly socialised already. It's, there's an implicit guarantee to all banks that if they go bust, first of all, you will lose some of your savings, and then the state will, will step in. Bail in, then bail out. So we, we need to, we need to socialise uh, it's partly socialised, the, the, the risks are socialised, the rewards are still privatised. So we need to, I think you need to step carefully. We're talking about a Labour government here, not a student union debate. Yeah. You know, a step carefully, but I would say, I would take RBS, accept the fact that it's never going to recover as a, as a proper capitalist bank. It's one of the biggest institutions in the world, even now. And then to the debate, would you use it as a centralised bank or would you, would you then 
break, it, break up its capital into regional banks. But for me, RBS should be the number one candidate for, the, for, for this National Investment Bank. There's no need to create... We could create a new one, but you still have to have the problem of what to do about RBS. We could, we, we could create a good bank, bad bank with RBS, and, and the, the good bank should be refocused to do what... You see, Barclays always did in this country. Barclays was a preeminent lender to SMEs, small businesses. It, it, it's useless now. But if you had a business that, that was literally brimming with money to, give, to, to lend at very uh, uh, decent rates to the kind of businesses that you might want to form, people around here, and already have formed, you know, and Brighton's full of small, innovative businesses, that... You know, and then HS2, and then a new motorway, and then you know a, a tidal barrage in Swansea. You know, these are tens of billions, and it could have 200. As you, you know, the program is 250, or we need to spend it in in 10 years. Mm. Sorry, can I jump in here? Yeah, I want to. Know, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Neo, I mean, neoliberalism for me is very simple. It was a class project. And it was a class project from the very beginning. It was not about the market. It was about consolidating class power. And I tried to write that out. And, and it's very interesting. It's very interesting what's happened. I tried to write that out in the brief history of neoliberalism. There are lots of books coming on about neoliberalism right now. And one tries to treat it as an ideology. Another tries to treat it as, you know, about the market. Another about that and that to the point where the, the, the concept becomes incoherent and half of people say you shouldn't use it anymore. Which means, great, we don't have to talk about the concentration of class power anymore. Well, fuck you, that's what we've got to talk about. <laughs> and, 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 and that's going straight to Facebook. And I'm, t I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this kind of stupid debate. You know, it's about consolidation. It's consolidation. And as you said, one of the bits of consolidation is you use the banks in a certain kind of way. Going off the gold standard in, in 1971 was the beginning point of a lot of this. It then allowed the credit system to be used in a certain kind of way, where you could actually start robbing the world like crazy. So actually, when you look at something like the Southeast Asian crisis, it was a thing where perfectly good economy was forced into bankruptcy by financial means, mm -hmm. then in stepped the banks, bought all the things up, and then sold them back at some vast things. The Chinese understand this, by the way. They have a little thing where they kind of say, hey, the United States right now, its economy is two-thirds based on robbing the rest of the world and one-third based on making things. And the robbery comes about through these institutions that get set up. The investment bank, I think it's a great idea, but one of the things it's got to do is, A, be democratized itself. It's all very well to say, we're in a patriarchal way, we're going to encourage democratization in a village, you know. Yeah, that's very nice, centralized decentralization. Uh, or, <laughs> what, or, 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 or we have to actually experiment with, with new ways in which that investment bank could itself be dem democratized. And the second thing is, it's got to challenge the main center of neoliberal power, which lies in what I call the state finance nexus, which is the coalition between the Treasury Department and the Bank of England in this country, between the Treasury Department in the United States and uh, you know, the Federal Reserve in the United States, because that's where a lot of the power is located. And you can play around with the rest of the economy all you like, but those are the people who really, really put it together. And it was great in 2008 when, after Lehman went bankrupt, because Congress didn't know what to do. They all <laughs> ran away and were all kind of silent. Bush, the president, didn't know what to do, and he disappeared down some rabbit hole. And who, who came out and said, this is what we do? The chair of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, plus Hank Paulson, came out and stood in front of the television and had a three-page piece of paper and said, this is what we do. And what did we do? We didn't bail the people out, no. We bail the banks out. That's what they said. And that was it. That was what, and that's neoliberalism. That's, that's neoliberalism in power for you. And, and we've got to keep that concept straight in our mind. I mean, we can chuck neoliberalism out if you want, that's fine. But don't forget the incredible importance of <clears throat> the class power that is being assembled right now. It is more, more concentrated and, and, and powerful now than it's ever been. And the big question for me is, how are they going to use that power to take these new technologies, which do indeed have lots of emancipatory possibilities and all the rest of it, and actually turn it to their advantage. How are they going to do that? That's the thing. And it's interesting. One of the things that we can discuss this a bit is the universal basic income. 
Now, you know, the left autonomistas have this, but who else has it? All the Silicon Valley mm. people. Mm. All the Silicon Valley people. That's what they want, a universal basic income. They want to have people delivered enough money to buy their product. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with being nice to people, having a basic... It's, my God, who's going to buy Netflix if they have no money? <laughs> and when, when we get that sort of economy is set up, that's what, that's what Silicon Valley wants. And, and so we've got to start thinking about that. And artificial intelligence is coming down very strong. What worries me is in the same way that the left fought in the, in, in the manufacturing sector against uh, automation and new organizational forms and all the rest of it, and basically lost you know, again and again and again as you know, working class uh, were destroyed by sort of deindustrialization and all of that. We're now going to see the same story repeated again in the service sector. And the big question for the left is, are we going to fight resistance to you know, artificial intelligence coming in in hospitals, all this kind of stuff? Are we going to fight it and lose? Or are we going to use it creatively and, and actually then push with it in certain kinds of ways? That's one of the big technological issues that I think we should be discussing. Do you want to respond to that, Paul? Let, let's get to the issue of Uber. And let's, let's try and... This is my understanding. Of, forget what's going on right now. But it, in 50 years' time, most cities will have a transport system that is automated. Um, it's entirely possible, intelligently run. But the question is, and this is the question actually of... The, the, the question of class power is posed right now, today, for everybody who understands that that will happen. Because either London's transport system will be run by an automated system that is centralised and whose logic is run on be, runs on behalf of everybody, and therefore social justice uh, debates and values will feed into it, should, should we have a tube... Uh, station down in this poverty-stricken borough or not, all things like that. Or it will be the system will reside in every atom of uh, the transport network. That is, the system will be the operating system in every car and every autonomous bus and every other thing that's in that system. If it's centralised, it will be entirely possible and I think necessary to cheapen it all because the point will be this thing will run itself, so its production cost, i.e. what does it produce, cost to produce a car, produce a bus, produce a train, will be the cost of running it, and you can subsidise it or not, but you could very easily reduce the cost of transport to pennies for everybody. If, it's, if the system is the operating system of every vehicle, that can't happen. In fact, the, having the operating system of every vehicle run the system will necessitate a transactional thing. So basically, can my car go in front of yours in this traffic jam becomes a question of cost. And that is where Uber is a company designed to prevent the emergence of centralised transport systems in cities. That's what it is. It's nothing to do with providing employment for, for, for poorly paid uh, cabbies. It is now, but they're designing the company for when autonomous cars come about. Note the word, autonomous, uh, not driverless. They want the cars to, to have an operating system that allows them to operate with independently of and actually in defiance of any traffic management system that's, that's actually already in place. So this conflict we're having right now about Uber, which I think we should all be very clear about, is not just a, a massively exploitative rip-off system. It's a conflict about who owns the data and who controls the smart city. And, you know, the people who put the money into Uber, the Saudi Arabian monarchy um, and, and the Silicon Valley guys, they're very clear that unless they produce a disruptive business model, the natural <laughs> outcome of the business model would be a centralised democratically controlled and ultra cheap and ultra, ultra, ultimately non-market transport system in every city within 50 years. That's what we should want. And they are the rebels. They are rebelling against modernity. So Paul said a few minutes ago that potentially any transition beyond fossil fuels to renewable energy may necessitate something akin to Stalinism, and I saw, uh, I saw Alice start writing something down. Um, do you want to 
tell us what you wrote? I think I just wrote Stalinism. <laughs> um, it's just an opportunity to write Stalinism. Um, no, I think it is, it's a really provocative point, and I think it's really important. Um, I think it is something that we should all think about. Um, so there was a paper that came out last week um, about whether we could, whether it that said that it was, they'd done the maths again, and they thought it was geophysically possible that we might be able to keep to 1.5 degrees warming. Which then got spun as, oh, actually, climate change isn't going to be a big problem anymore. The scientists have discovered it's not going to be a It is still going to be a problem. There's a lot, big difference between being geophysically possible, uh, or not, not being geophysically impossible, I think was their phrase, and um, being a political and a cultural and a social and economic in inevitability. And there's a, there's a massive gap between those things for us from where we are socially, politically, economically, and to some extent te technologically, although I think that's less of an issue. Um, one way of looking at the, you know, the fear, looking at fear of climate change in the eye is to go, we want some kind of Stalinist response. But I would still say that we cannot do that. I really quite, I think that is what powers me to go to work every day, is not just that I'm scared of climate change, is that I'm terrified about the way we may respond to climate change, and that we may do it very, very badly. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that I'm not the only one who feels this way. So I think we should heed, like, you know, warnings like the thing that Paul just said properly, and we should think about that, but at the same time, we should be working on, to try and do community uh, energy alongside large-scale things. We can have big and small and medium together. We can have things like, a, we have the array in Denmark, which has got a community offshore wind turbine. It's alongside a larger commercial one owned by the part state-owned Dong. I mean, there are ways of doing this to different hybrids. And I also really like that you mentioned the uh, Tidal Lagoon project in Swansea, because one of the really interesting things about this project is it is not just about imagining renewable energy. And a lot of the rhetoric about the Tidal Lagoon project is all about how many jobs it's going to create, how much money it's going to save, how much carbon it's going to save. All of those things are important, but it misses a very beautiful bit of that project, which is still very important if you talk to the people involved in it, which is totally reimagining what we mean by a energy... Um, a, a way of producing energy, an energy, a power station. So this is a power station that's not just going to be making power and giving jobs. It's like a park and a cultural space and that you can go to art concerts there and there'll be like wildlife and birds and you'll spend time there and you'll know people who work there and you'll have an opportunity to argue about climate change in the building, so, which is completely different from a nuclear power plant with loads of get out of here security alerts around the side of it. It's completely reimagining our relationship to energy and that can be done alongside very large scale state sponsored, state funded projects. So that's different from a Stalinist vision mm. of rapid, rapid decarbonisation. I'm going to come to you in a second, James. Um, I want to just build on what you were saying, Alice. There's, are you, I think it's Peter Thiel who talks about this stuff. Um, and you were saying, oh, the, the Silicon Valley is now saying, oh, maybe heating may, may be uh, sort of kept to 1.5. Peter Thiel talks about us launching something into space where we sort of block out a certain amount of sunlight. And geoengineering. And, right, the geoengineering stuff. And then the carbon sequestration. And like you say, these guys are the most interested in that stuff because it means that they could basically persist with the current mode of production. So, mm. I mean, that, that really belies the fundamental point about the relationship between technology and capitalist social relations. Uh, James, would a national investment bank fund a people's Uber? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think we said it would. So, there you go. Right. Really? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> I think I was, I was pretty certain that, that we even said that somewhere in the manifesto, and John said it on, on occasion. A people's Uber? Yeah, yeah. Platform co-ops for, for everybody, you know. This is what I meant about the finance, not just National Investment Bank, but other uh, new financial institutions on, on a local scale, on whatever scale really you need. I mean, the part of the issue here, if, we, if we're talking about finance, I mean, part of the issue here is, is that we basically have, like, what, five very, very large banks that behave in one particular way, and then that's kind of it. Now, if you have multiple different institutions under different kinds of control with different uh, priorities, other than, like, you know, try and make as much money as possible, as fast as possible, uh, as seamlessly as possible for your shareholders, then you could start to talk about funding different things. So, of course, things like platform cooperatives, things like saying, actually, why can't we take this technology, which is relatively easy to reproduce. I mean, this is the big dirty secret, I suppose, behind some of this. Relatively easy to reproduce and put it in the hands of the people that actually work with that technology and use that technology. So, of course, something like a people's Uber, why not? I mean, that, that I think, would be an essential part of what you want to do. I mean, it's classical Keynesianism, is it? Because you've got all the labour... You've got all the capital, either fixed capital, the cars are there, but Uber could disappear in a couple of months and all of a sudden 40,000 people are unemployed. Is that, I mean, what, so what would that kind of intervention of saying a people, a, 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 what, 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 what do you call it? Platform cooperatives. Platform cooperatives. 
What would that look like in that instance? Would it be all of a sudden, you know, a sudden injection of, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds? I mean, what, what would substantively, what would that mean in this particular incidence of 40,000 workers, you know, all of a sudden just like losing I'm, I'm going to annoy you by stepping away from the particular instance of, of Uber in this one, but if more generally, the, 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 the bit that we're pushing up against here... And, and the okay, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it. Would, 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 it, would it be, would you give workers still the means... still going to do the same, I mean, you're still yeah, no, going to no. the same non-answer. So Look, like... no, you've, you've, you've learned well, James. <laughs> We've got, you know, we've got the Blairites of the left now. But what, would you, would right, you so say... I'm a policy wonk. No, I'm a Blairite of the left. <laughs> yeah, we, go, we go back. It's fine. Um, not that far would, back. Would you, would you, well, no, that's true. Seven years, not that long. <laughs> would you give workers the means, basically, to buy their workplaces? Is that, is that... Yeah, well, that's basically what we're getting at. Yeah. The, the, the bit here is, is what, what you're talking about is, is two things. I think... In terms of the manifesto this year and what people have said and what we've done and, and how far the whole movement has got on this, is that in order to pay for a whole load of public services, we need to tax more effectively than we are. And that means tax basically people have money more effectively than we are doing. That's what the manifesto said. That was the 5%, 95% division. That was saying that we need to tax big corporations more than they are. Not actually that much more. I mean, it's back up to the level of George Osborne, even in 2011, we're saying with corporation tax. If you do that, then we can pay for public services and things. This does not get us into some of the more fundamental problems in the economy over the longer term, which is this enormous distribution, uh, maldistribution, concentration of wealth, of power in a, in a few hands and what you start to do about that. Now, the exciting thing about some of these technologies, and it's not just actually the digital stuff where you can see straight away that like you can copy software incredibly rapidly and cheaply and it's just there and you've got it. So why not have it more collectively owned? I mean, that's what lurks behind Uber and other such companies. Why not have that more collectively and democratically owned? You can see how you do that, but also on the level of manufacturing, on the level of production, you can see that the scale of production need it uh, now, that you, you move from a world in which things are done on a, an enormous scale in assembly lines to things are done 3D printing, to things can be done in, in other different forms of technology. Now, if you start to think about that, and if you have this capital that can operate on a smaller scale, it becomes a lot easier to see how you can democratise it, decentralise it, give it to people, and fund the institutions that will do that. And those institutions should ideally be owned by uh, the people who are working there. And that would be a more democratic, better, fairer, more egalitarian way uh, of running society. That's what you need to push for. To make that happen, you need new institutions. You do need something like a national investment bank, the regional development banks. It does need to be under democratic control. It does need to have that sense that this is what we're going to do, that we're taking the wealth that's there and we're giving it back into the hands of people. So instead of saying that you have this incredible concentration of wealth and power at the top, we can use the technology that we have. We can take the technology that we have and give it back into the hands of people. But to do that requires an institutional change. That is the point we're talking about the National Investment Bank and finance more generally. I and mean, it comes down to this, right? The fundamental point, I suppose, is would you trust the people who crash the banks to also run the robots, right? That's kind of the nub of the argument. Right? So... So in other words, you have to try and take that technology and give it to people and find different ways of running. We have to. We have very, very few choices on this. Otherwise, the, the system runs away with us. Great. I mean, that, that sounds like a... I like, I like the framing of the real right to buy, you know? Mm. Uh, and I think that's absolutely right. You know, the right to buy your workplace is phenomenal. Um, David, we've got just under 15 minutes left. Then we'll go to questions and we finish at 20 past. I believe that's still okay with the, the TWT gang. Good, good. Um, you mentioned briefly AI, David. How would you manage it? Oh. Because Elon, Elon Musk has talked about this, hasn't he? He said the big problem yeah. is when we get AI is that all of a sudden are phenomenal. They'll augment human intelligence in a way which doesn't look like the singularity, but all of a sudden people have access to a resource which is more valuable than thousands of human brains, et cetera. So how can we manage that in a, in a, I mean, a post-capitalist way? I, you know, frankly, I don't know. <laughs> um, to begin with, I think this is where, you know, for most of us, we're at the edge of this, and, and I think that we don't know quite what all is involved, but we should be sitting around thinking about it and getting lots and lots of ideas about it. Uh, because uh, it is uh, now possible, it, part, and partly because AI itself, as, as I understand it, is, is doubling in capacity almost every two years or something, so in 10 years' time, we're likely to find all kinds of things uh, which, which will be possible to do. Um, I'm, I'm uh, interested in questions of how AI might 
uh, relate to more more concretely uh, questions of say urban and regional planning because I, I think you know it's all very well saying we want to reduce you know fossil fuels and we want to have uh, driverless cars and all that kind of stuff but we also got to think about you know why people are making journeys in the first place and what kind of journeys they are and and what they're for and one of the things that is a, is a bit astonishing about contemporary society is the way in which everything seems to be quite upside down. I mean, we have all of this immense labor-saving uh, equipment in, in household. I mean, household technologies, for example, have gone you know, through the roof over the last 30, 40 years. Um, but if you kind of say, has that made life easier for people? The answer we generally get back is no. So there's a whole kind of question of what the kind of emancipation is about and what freedom is about. And I think this is where it comes back to, I think, some of the things you're interested in. Is, I, I mean, I think disposable time, free time, is one of the great things that we can aim for. That is where, you know, we go back to the pre-capitalist world in which the working day was four hours. And under those circumstances, you have a, a, a much more civilized society than, you know, when, when, when that actually... We, we cover all of the basics, and as Marx kind of puts it, the realm of freedom begins when you leave the realm of necessity behind. And we have to think about the, that necessity. Now, in the middle of this, of course, what we're, doing, what we're getting is an incredible pressure coming from capital to create new forms of necessity. Mm. And, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, when I talk about this, I sometimes find myself being dubbed as anti-consumerist. No, I think... It's good that we have certain levels of consumption, but there is a form of conspicuous consumption which is kind of, and, and waste which is going on in the world of consumerism, which also needs to be paid very close attention to. About 40% of the food supply in the United States goes to waste. I mean, and you kind of go, well, we've got to think about you know, how to pull that all back in. And are there uh, uh, AI techniques that could address those sorts of questions? So. For me, one of the issues is not to necessarily dwell entirely on AI, although we need to know a lot about its capacities and its powers, but we have to also have some vision of what kind of society we want to live in, what kind of people we want to be. And there is a moral argument being made right now. I mean, it's very strong in the United States. Do we all want to live like Donald Trump and be like Donald Trump? And a lot of the other people are saying, hell no. You know, that's not who we are, and that's not what a human being should be. And, and I think that actually... <laughs> Actually, that, 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 you know, I mean, this can get a mishy-washy kind of moralistic debate, but on the other hand, I think it's worth having uh, because then the question of, uh, it's not simply about AI, it's what it, what it is that we would want to harness AI to do, mm. which would liberate us from uh, the kind of drudgery that many people live in right now. I mean, just quickly responding to that, for me, uh, when you look at AI and renewable energy, uh, Jeremy Rifkin talks about the technology energy matrix of fossil fuels with the steam engine. And I view this pairing of AI with ever cheaper solar in particular. I think it could be just as disruptive as this technology, which, like you say, really uh, underpinned the globalization of capitalism remarkably quickly. Mark Cuban, uh, who's a technolog technology entrepreneur, owns a basketball team, I believe, he said that AI would create the world's first trillionaire. Uh, Paul, why, why is it easier in the head of Mark Cuban to conceive of a trillionaire than, than post-scarcity communism? I'm surprised he said trillionaire. Yeah, gazillionaire. Quadrillionaire, at least. Exo <laughs> uh, look, the, the, the challenge and the in immense potential are summed up in that question. When, when, when Google's DeepMind computer beat the best Go player in the world uh, last year, yeah, the, the move that made everybody cry, including all the ninth Dans who, 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 uh, uh, at Go. Let's go very quickly. Go is a Japanese board game that's much more uh, complex than chess, and therefore you, a computer can easily win at chess, but one had never beaten the best Go player in the world. Yeah. because So it, it made a move. What, what it asked itself is, what's the best move I can make that a human wouldn't make? And it, went, it, found, a, a, a ten, it found a 10,000 to 1 chance move that no human would have made, made it, and all the guys went, oh my God, because they won. So what does that mean? This was told to me by somebody who, who works closely to that team. Um, for 3,000 years, we, we had an orchard. An orchard is a technology that's more or less stayed the same since 
Iran in 1500 BC. About 30 years ago, you could put a barcode on, a, on, a, on, a, on an apple. Um, uh, from about 10 years ago, you could have drones fly in, sniff the, you know, sniff the apple, pick it and fly it. You automate the orchard. What the Google DeepMind thing means is that you show the computer an apple and say, How, what's the best way to make 10 million of these? That's the difference. It will think of things we can't think of. Now, from that, you can see why it might make a trillionaire. Because, unlike the internet is today, it's an incredibly, di um, incredibly distributed power system. It's networked. It has nodes, and the nodes can talk to each other, as we all do on our, our cell phones, without a centralised uh, gatekeeper of the information. The real danger of AI, to me, is it's going to give social power to the organisation that, con that, ha that controls the inputs and the outputs. In, in other words, it takes you back to Alan Turing's, you know, uh, Ferranti uh, massive supercomputer was one. You know, it, it, it takes you back to a world where computing is in the hands of somebody, and that's a really big, big thing because that somebody is either going to be Peter Thiel and his proto-fascist right-wing Silicon Valley people, or it's going to be the state, which is equally frightening to me, or there's a, I think there's a very legit, since we're talking sort of think piece, think tank kind of stuff, there's a very legitimate argument that says, until you can control it democratically, don't invent it. Alice, any thoughts on uh, artificial intelligence transition beyond fossil fuels? Maybe not artificial intelligence, but there's a sort of element of the mixture. You were talking about a mixture of artificial intelligence and solar, mm. but there's a sort of stage before artificial intelligence of a kind of... At the moment, one of the problems we've got with our energy system is it's really analogue. It's not moved to digital, and we're seeing some movement of digital. One of the big transitions in our energy system we're going to see in the next few years is a movement to being more digital, which is going to allow it to start feeding into... that. You're going to start to be able to see that intersection of energy and, and AI. Uh, but we're also seeing just this stage at the moment where some people are getting smart meters. It's a very basic level of trust, like kind of who owns that information about your home mm. and I, I worry about the way that we're doing I think smart meters are great potentially there could be a lot of power in smart meters for us for to reduce the um, amount of energy we're using and make ourselves more comfortable without feeling like we just have to reduce everything in a kind of like we have to have, make everything scarce we have to just uh, put on a jumper this is about being efficient about our homes and looking at where we're losing energy and where we can use it more maybe being efficient working with local renewables is a project we're working um, with a community in Wales where it means that they can using a network of smart meters and they're working with co-op energy so they're sort of they're a club they can club together and they can act as a buyer of renewable energy for the local hydro plant which means that they get a better without having to go through the middleman which we all normally do when we buy energy in from the grid so if you live here and you live opposite those giant wind turbines you can't buy electricity from those wind turbines you have to buy it from the grid and the people who own the wind turbines have to sell it to the grid mm. and it's just it's, it's not necessarily giving everyone the best deal um, but this community that we're working with in Wales, they can buy direct from their hydro plant, they, let, they save money, and the hydro plant can get more money because they also get a better price, which means that they can invest it in renewables. There's all sorts of things that we could be doing with smart meters that would be brilliant, but I'm really worried about the way we're doing it. And I think there's maybe, a, I think we should have lots of expansive, interesting conversations about AI, but I don't want us to worry, don't want us to miss this kind of more everyday conversation about Nest or whatever technology some of you may be being offered and who owns that and how we do that well. And I'd like to see groups like the Labour Party talking about how we might think about community owned forms of that, yeah. public owned forms of that, uh, and who owns these platforms. I mean, the intersection of that is, um, is Alexa, right? Amazon Alexa. Mm -hmm which is obviously all Google Home, which is in your home. And it's eventually what you're going to see within homes and obviously within communities is an energy internet, where energy is distributed in ways and channeled in ways, which is optimal. Um, similarly, uh, objects like your phone will be able to store energy. And when something else in the home needs it, it'll go there and so on. This may all sound very strange, but fundamentally, it's the same ecology that we see with the formation of a logistical internet of which Paul was talking, where you have cars and warehousing robots and trains and buses, which are all entirely aut autonomous. <coughs> all integrated in a, a manner w in which uh, we have uh, optimal outputs. So. Uh, what's that? But who, but who controls, controls it? it? And fundamentally, like you say, unless it's withdrawn from capitalist social relations, 
It's not good. Potentially. I mean, certainly. I mean, it'll mean things like your washing machine working at the best time of day for when your solar panels are working, which is potentially really good. But you might worry about your washing machine working when you're not there. And there's reason, there's perfectly reasonable reasons why people would worry about that sort of thing. And we need to be careful about how fast we go and make sure that we're transparent about it and take people with us. Otherwise, I think we'll get backlash. This is one of the reasons why I worry about a kind of very heavy top down, we could say Stalinist or some other word, like uh, revolution in terms of how we use energy is that people will be left behind and then they're going to start to hate it and then we're going to get festering of, of people not wanting to move we'll get people hating smart meters we'll be getting people who aren't going to come with us and if we want to do this well and fast I think we do need to bring people with us and work with them um, otherwise I don't think it will happen that fast at, at all it won't happen fast enough and it won't happen well in a fair way that's not going to cause other problems in other places James, uh, finally, and then we're going to go to questions um, very quickly. Did you want to respond to anything in particular? Or? Okay, um, I've got a question for you. I mean, at the level of government, we've got a shadow cabinet, which is many people presume is a government in ways. I know you can't say that. Um, to what extent are the people that would be going into the Treasury, uh, business innovation and skills, et cetera, et cetera, are they thinking concretely about these challenges around, for instance, solar, who owns data, AI? Uh, and is that the role of the Labour Party, or would you say, well, actually, no, think tanks should be thinking about these things, and there should be a broader conversation within the well, left I mean, about it? Whatever happens, there's a broader conversation about it. I mean, we, we put out, um, it was published during the election campaign, uh, a document on alternative models of ownership, which went into some of this, which I'd recommend if people are interested in having a look through, um, and, and precisely makes the case for uh, how you, you create new institutions that, that democratise the economy, that, that give people uh, a bigger stake in, in the wealth of society, that is things like everything from public ownership of major bits of infrastructure, like the railways, for instance, all the way down to what do we do on a, on a smaller scale with this, this problem of large numbers of baby boomers retiring leaving behind small businesses with no obvious people to sell it to or to, you know, that potentially there's, there's a very large number of businesses that just cease because no one's going to buy it. There's no one else there. Now, there, is, there are solutions to this that might well involve, well, for instance, the people who work in that business could take it over, for instance. So it's relatively sort of mundane, smaller scale things. It goes through some of that and, it, and it's worth, worth a read. The, the broader question, I think, is, is the one that, that, that people have touched on. It, it is about power. And it is about power in society, and that's really what, what economics ends up being about, whichever way you, you, you look at it. What we have at the minute, I think, and this is exciting around what's happening with the Labour Party and, and more generally, is that you can see that there's a series of problems in society. The underlying ones for the British economy in particular, and I think it is nice to have a conversation about this technological new world that could be out there. The truth of the British economy is that the institutions we have are poorly set up to deal with any of this, aren't going to deliver much of this. The crudest indicator of that is the, the slide in investment in high-tech manufacturing in lots and lots of other things you might expect an economy that was working towards getting any of this stuff to be investing in, the slide in, in research and development spending for a number of years, the actual cuts in research spending that this government under George Osborne pushed through. So you can see that these institutions don't work. They don't get you that. They get you a different version of that, which is the low wages, the labour market that produces insecure work, the substitution of cheap labour for investment over a longer period of time. Now, if we have an economy as institutions can't deliver these things, the question to ask is how do you get institutions that can and that's when you get the steps down the road towards saying, well, this is how the whole society could look different. This is where we start to address some of the questions of who benefits from this technology? How can we make it work better? How can we make it work for the benefit of everyone? Great. Right. Um, <laughs> good. We have 20 minutes left. I believe there are two roving mics. Uh, yes, please put your hands up, and then there'll be two people walking around giving the mics out. We'll take three questions at a time, uh, and then the people that are addressed can respond to them. So, where are the microphones? There's a mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you want to just, you, you, okay, one of you guys goes first and then just pick three people up. Whoever gets the mic first asks, answers the first question. This person at the back here with their hand up, right at the back. Right at the back, on the left. Uh, and then, oops, excuse me. My eyes are so terrible, you know. Bloody hell, this is what happens when you get old. This chap here. Shall I just crack on? Please go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, capitalism isn't just a concentration of class power. It's also a concentration of geopolitical power. So in the context of uh, capitalism today, where the 
materials that we're talking about, for the technologies we're talking about, come from uh, rare earth materials, which are pulled out of the ground in areas with poor working conditions um, and cause a lot of environmental degradation. What are the risks attendant to the project that we're talking about here? Because you can quite easily, I mean, we can envision the world we're talking about now, but to me, it could become more of like a, a fortress Europe becomes starship Europe. Mm. Like the, the West gets a lot and the rest of the world kind of has to suffer. So we get, um, we get maybe Elysium and the rest of the world gets Mad Max. Very good. Uh, this chap here, yeah. Hello, uh, back to the technology and uh, its misuse. As Mason said, if it is not socially controlled, don't invent it. And I concur with him in the statements completely because the technology that has been invented these days is such that it is used not only to manipulate but to victimize individuals, some of us who are minorities of who we talk about the extremism of capitalism and you are seen as a danger to the establishment and society to the point where we are vulgarized, pulverized, and completely misused as individuals as well as what. So that we, as we see it actually, it is the so-called middle class who are aware and know so-called right wing, including such a public, I mean, public only owned companies like BBC, who are hell-bent on playing or whatever plays they put on or the arts they make and all these things, paralyzing individuals and all these things just because to making them a laughing stock so that they may have no integrity or no purpose for their lives for which we must disabuse socially and collectively. Thanks. I'll take one more. Yes, this woman here. Um, just listening to your discussion of artificial, in artificial intelligence, prior to AI is the massive accumulation of data, personal data, and as more devices come on the internet, um, energy devices, other household devices, a massive amount of information about people's everyday lives. In a situation where, and I cannot emphasize this enough, um, of prevalent and endemic insecurity, and we don't have enough people working on that, at, at, the, at the moment, and, it's, and the problem is getting bigger and bigger. Um, is the question, you know, and we, we live in an era where that aggregation of data is happening already. Is the key question about who owns that data and how it's controlled, or should we be trying to resist that further aggregation right, right. entirely? That's it. Good. Um, so we've got three questions. We'll start with you, David. You can answer all of them or none of them. Obviously, try and be as concise as possible. We'll do another probably round of questions. Well, the thing about data is there's, there's some things you can collect data about and some you can't. And, and uh, one of the big problems that exists right now is if you can't to convert something into data, the tendency is to believe it doesn't exist. Now, here's one of the major contradictions that how do you get data on alienation, for example? That's very difficult. And in fact, we're living in a world in which almost two thirds of the population of the world are alienated, deeply alienated. So you're collecting data on all kinds of things, you know, like your traffic habits and you know, what you bought in the store yesterday. And, and, and a lot of it is being used, I think, also for this kind of question that the contemporary state has become a, essentially a militarized state apparatus, which is into a punitive politics rather than into actual social serving. And, and uh, again, there is a big political kind of problem of conversion of, of, of that, because otherwise, to the degree that you try to maintain any kind of democracy, then the de democracy is going to end up with some crazy electoral results, which, of course, is the sort of thing we're seeing. And, and again, I, I, so uh, you're right, you're right. There's, a, there's a lot of data which is all kind of getting out all over the place and people use it for all sorts of reasons. Um, I'm very much in the habit these days of when something comes up, I lie. So, that, uh, so maybe we should have a mass lying uh, mm. kind of a thing when anybody wants to know, you know, and, 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 
uh, you know, so the various things like that. Geopolitically, I think we haven't discussed the kind of whole kind of question of geopolitics. It's too big to go into here, and I think the whole kind of question of where China's going, I'm very much into that these days, and what's going on with the Chinese economy, and, and, and what that uh, bodes for everything from energy consumption to, uh, to you know, uh, technological transformations and the geopolitics of uh, the one belt, one road, all those sorts of things. So there are all sorts of issues of that kind, but we haven't had a chance to, uh, and I think it's probably impossible for us to get in d any depth uh, that here. Can I answer your question, uh, slightly tangentially? Um, w one of the important things that information capitalism does is that it, it creates an industry around what economists call externalities. Externalities used to be, if you've got a power station and here's my washing line, your pollution hits my washing line, how do I solve the problem that I'm, I'm not doing business with you? How, do you? how do I charge you? And the capitalist economists said, well, you create taxation, you create penalties for the polluting, uh, polluting power station. But now we have positive externalities. That we, we, information, the, the idea that somebody who can look at all the uh, aggregated data of Tesco's uh, Tesco's uh, com consumer, uh, everything we do in a Tesco can work out a lot of things. They can work out, that if you know what street all the uh, diseases of poverty and obesity are in, in, in where I come from, South London, uh, if you knew what those people were buying in Tesco, you could work out to tell them not to buy it. Um, in other words, there are huge social power re residing in this data, but the question is, what do we do with it? The, ex the positive externality of network data creating new knowledge is all being controlled by giant monopolies whose en entire existence, they're pre-designed to know what you're doing. Uber is pre-designed not just to know where you travel from, it's, it's imputing who you are. It's working out what, you, what you've done. Now, this is incredible. We need social power over reality. The project of progressive politics, socialism, is to create social power for everybody overall reality. But we need to, so, so you ask, should it be centralized or decentralized? I, arg I would argue the, the moment where decentralized control over, over data is gonna solve this has kind of gone. So, so in a city like Barcelona, um, Ada Colau, who's the radical left mayor of Barcelona said, we want information sovereignty for the city. So insofar as it becomes smart, that it has a smart health system, a smart um, public transport system that, where, that sees your, Jeep, your, your phone as you go in and works out what station you usually come out at, we own the data. The data is a public good. Now, the moment Carlisle said this, the moment the, uh, in, the global uh, consultancy and IT industry went nuts. Um, she, they're the only customer in the entire world that's told them they can't have the data. And I think Brighton could do it. I think London could do it. It's an easy, it's a templated idea. You take the data and you say data is a public good. And it's almost like saying I'm an ultra, I'm a luxury communist. You know, it's almost like the most radical thing you can say is that data should be a commonly owned public good. As long as, of course, it's anonymized because the worst thing you want is Joe Blow here in this street, find it. But yeah, you say, well, I think, I think the creation of data sets that are anonymized is actually weirdly what Facebook, that's its, that's its business. It sells anonymized data sets. So look, we could get into a discussion about how possible it is. But if we can't, if we can't anonymize it, again, we shouldn't be using it. But I think that the immense social power that we could gain over reality by using our, our, our data as a public good has to be the aim, for me anyway, and, and that means centralised data storage. Well, that's, a really, that's a really appealing vision that Paul's given, although it's reminding me of um, back when I used to work more in health policy and we had conversations about NHS data and a lot of arguments about that. And it, there was a lot of people got this will be owned by the NHS, we trust the NHS, this is using data for social good. And there were a lot of very good medical reasons why we, this would help researchers and it would help us find new ways to, to treat medical conditions. And it was a very appealing vision. And this, at the end, it didn't work for lots of political reasons, but I was still very dubious. Uh, I, was, I was a bit scared of it, basically, because I thought there were other things in our 
in our society and our economics, and especially the way the NHS is going, that made me worry a bit about it being okay now. Like, it's an mm. idea, I like it, I'd like us to be able to move to that. I don't think there are other things that we are ready for. But I wanted to, I wanted to thank you for raising that issue, because I think it's a really important one. And also the one about... Um, rare earth minerals and one of the things that it really made me think about was uh which we haven't really touched on i think enough so mm. far was the gap that a lot of us have when we between the knowledge about the technological objects that we use uh, and our everyday experience of them and particularly how that is encouraged i think by people who make a lot of the technological objects to sell to us but i think the iphone is the perfect example of that it is the black box that looks very shiny it's wonderful it gives you so much power when you use it but it's impossible to have a sense of what's inside it and it's, a very, it's very difficult to understand what, may, what, what was put in it. And it's even difficult for Apple, at least they say, to know what, where the minerals that, were, that it was made from came from. If you contrast that with the Fairphone, I don't know if any of you have ever come in con of, of encountered the Fairphone. It's a wonderful uh, sort of half art project, activist piece, half actual smartphone. Um, some people who use it, has anyone here got a, a, a Fairphone? Some people, yeah, like, okay. Some people who use it. Some people use it. Love it. Uh, my partner is a, will still say, even when he's annoyed at it not working, that it's a brilliant bit of tech. Uh, some people who use it hate them. But I think the fact that it, it, it's, it is trying to be a fair phone, a fair trade smartphone, and they, they will admit that it's almost impossible to do that. It, that it is actually impossible to have a fair trade um, smartphone. But the process that it's made from is to uh, invite you to ask questions about it. This is why I think of it a bit like an art project. It invites you to question where things come from. And it's physically put together so you can take it apart and you can understand a bit about what it's made from. And you, the website tells you where everything comes from. Complete opposite to the beautiful black, shiny, you know, black mirror of the iPhone. Um, and I think that we need more technological objects like the Fairphone that invite us to ask questions about that. And that would also relate to, so to understanding our data and thinking about... We, at the moment, I think we're sleepwalking into a lot of really dangerous work, things with tech. And that's partly because we're being encouraged not to pay attention to what we're doing and where things are coming from. And it may be that... Uh, we just need to, I think it's, if we're going to do tech well, we need to build a better relationship to our knowledge of where those te technological objects come from uh, and what we're doing with our, when we're sharing data on things like Facebook or, or stuff like that. So it's a knowledge gap, I think, for us. Mm. Right, we've got five more minutes. So I'm going to take two more questions. Okay, they have to be very, very, very concise. Uh, my eyes are so bad. I'll tell you what, this person here in the red scarf. Just the front, just there. Yep, red scarf. Hi, um, so you mentioned um, obviously what place AI could have in the process of like technological emancipation. Um, on a similar vein, what do you think of the place of space exploration and technology um, <laughs> In, the, yeah, in, in that similar process. Um, I don't want to make a dichotomy, but could it be eman um, emancipating? Or is it more of like a kind of narcissistic utopian fantasy uh, that provides a get out for the past sins and actions of capitalism? Um, and if, it, if space travel became socialized, um, would if what this became socialized? affect? Sorry? If what became socialized? Um, so space, space travel, travel right, and exploration, yes, yes. um, would that affect? Um, yeah. That yeah. relation. One more. Um, this person here with the maroon top. Actually, go on, we'll take you as well. Yeah, this chap here and then this young woman at the back, at the front. Quite like this, making the big decisions. <laughs> I used a bit of tech recently on a, on a conference called Slideo, which I would, as we're talking about tech, it worked really well for um, avoiding this is more of a comment than a question, just as a recommendation for people who find that frustrating. Slideo. It's a, Slideo. It allows people in the audience to, re, uh, to sort of type in their questions and then the chair can see them and can also... Oh. Yeah, no, TWT. No, it works really well. It's great. Yes. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Very disruptive. Uh, okay, too many questions. Um, right, let's do this one. Uh, Data is already a public good, and we call it academia. <laughs> is no, no, it's it is a public good. It's uh, um, or at least like the current idea of academia is like pr uh, producing more and more uh, accessible data sets is kind of thing. And actually, something I'm worried about is because as uh, Nick uh, Sir Nick, I can never pronounce his last name, um, keeps po uh, pointed out about data accumulation. 
and that it is necessarily that the business model is necessarily monopolistic. I don't. What I'm actually worried about is: Do you think Facebook is going to start coming for universities as a competitor of data production? Good. Yes. Yes, the panel have to be very, very quick. 30 seconds to a minute each. I don't know if the answers will be quick to this one, but basically, uh, Alice, I really liked how you spoke about how we have to bring people along with this idea about you know, technological advancement, particularly around um, energy. But if we think that a lot of the consumption, and this links it back to what David was saying earlier on as well, a lot of our consumption is uh, connected to notions of fetishization, of this romantic notions we have about products like Apple, like whatever it is. How can we recreate things that are in public ownership but that still appeal to people in a way that is real and that is sexy and that is appealing and that it hits our desire right in the core? <laughs> Should we start with, do you, do you want to respond to these James, or? Yeah, this, uh, well, how can we make public ownership sexy, I think. Not, well, also producing public goods, which is oh, sexy. Sorry, right. yeah. Which I suppose appeals to an aesthetic sensibility. Um, well, uh, right. uh, quick answer. Well, look, Tom, Tom Ford heading up, you know, the Ministry of Aesthetic. That, that's, uh, <laughs> I think it's going Why off not? on a tangent slightly. I'm gonna give you such a dull answer to this one. Right? <laughs> so it's, uh, look, the, no, why is it that rail renationalisation is still popular? Is it because everyone misses British Rail and, and uh, everything it stood for? No, it isn't. It's because what we've got at the minute doesn't work very well. What tends to produce answers like, wouldn't it be better if someone else ran this, is like the experience of trying to get here in Southern Rail, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> but, and that's how you start with an appeal. Now, the step beyond this is how do we get to a point where instead of an argument being roughly, okay, whoever's got all this money and they're investing in technology, they're the innovator. And anybody who questions this is basically some sort of Luddite. And that's, that's the kind of dichotomy, as it's phrase you've seen actually in the last few days, that if you sort of suggest that the market solutions or the market outcome that you're getting to here is problematic in some way, then in fact you're opposed to technology itself. I think disentangling those two things is a challenge. I suspect it's already happening because technology itself is getting us to the point where actually, you know, you can produce something very cheaply and distribute it very cheaply, and it's just obvious that it can be shared, and it's a collective production of something that is the internet. You can already see what technology, disassociated from immediate, explicit private ownership, starts to look like. So I suspect there's already bits of examples there. It's just spreading that example around. Alice? Uh you said when you said about making things appealing, you also said making them real. And I th that was maybe just because you were, you know, forming the question. But I, mean, I, I, don't think it's, I don't think our desire for a lot of these objects is real. I think some of it is real, but I think some of it isn't real too. And part of what we can offer is just different forms of desire. Uh, but also I don't see why we couldn't have Topshop um, destroyed and remade as a workers' cooperative, really. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't see why we can't have cool things. And maybe that goes back to the space travel thing. Maybe we could have space travel, you know, under uh, what, what, um, fully automated luxury communism. Um, I would worry a bit about space travel because apparently there's something to do with where it admits, uh, where, where, where you would be, um, the, the, like you could be particularly environmentally damaging apparently mm. space travel, so let's not do that. But we could create one that's like a low, I don't know, a non-emission spacecraft and then let's all go to the moon because that would be fun. <laughs> Um, I, Space I think, socialism, beauty, uh, yeah, um, public goods. Interestingly enough, look, what's interesting is that wh when I said Peter Thiel of uh, PayPal is a proto-fascist, I mean it. He has theorised, he's written in 2009, I no longer believe freedom and democracy are compatible. This is what the American right are doing. And what he said he's is... He's working for the Trump administration, yeah, is that right? What he said is... There's two things, we, three things we can do. We can colonise outer space, we can colonise the sea, or we can colonise the cyberspace and create... The, they did the third, yeah? They created the alt-right there. So they, they, they have a project, and they are imagining human life 100 years hence, and they control the, the access to capital. Capital such as exists on a scale that can invest in these massive space travel projects are, is owned by Silicon Valley. Um, no. okay... From, how do we go from there to things we can do? I want to finish with this, with a proposal. Wiener Werkstätte was the, was the beautiful Art Nouveau uh, publicly financed uh, design bureau in, in Vienna. 
Bauhaus in 1920s Germany. Russia also had the constructivist artists in Russia had their equivalent of the Bauhaus. What they were all trying to do was, was to create beautiful, trendy, um, mass-producible things for workers that would make workers' lives more beautiful than anybody else's and ultra-cheap. And I think one thing, the first left government that comes to power, Syriza should have done this, should have created or like fostered the creation of a new design bureau that is there to create cheap, recyclable, circularly producible goods that have the hallmark... The, believe me, kids age 16 would be wearing that logo for serious, because it means I'm saving the goddamn planet and I'm fucking capitalism at the same time. <laughs> Who doesn't want to do both of those things? David? Yeah, my, uh, my views of space travel have been uh, perverted a bit by reading uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's novels. Uh, but the key thing there is that you kind of... Um, uh, you repli if, you, if you replicate the same social relations as you go, then it doesn't make any yeah, difference, yeah. you know? And I, this is the problem. And this brings me, if you like, to the, again... We have, a, we, are, we have a tremendous amount of information. We have a tremendous amount of data, right? And this could be used, and is used, of course, by the corporations as instruments of dom domination. And, and we could use it, and, 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 you know, quite a few people on the left are pretty adept at using it, too. And, and I think that we also have a, a pretty sophisticated system of uh, communication. Though, of course, we find out right now that, that uh, the... National Security Administration is listening to all of it, and 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 so, yeah. Yeah. so uh, it, it's not as great as it is. But I think the one thing we're really short of, we've got the information, we've got the social communication, but but the big problem we've got right now is the organisation. Where's the organisation? And I think that that is not something that is given, if you like, by the tech data and the tech question and all the rest of it. It's saying well. Until we have a really good organisation on the ground, we're not being in a position uh, to look at AI and say, no, we don't want that kind of AI, we want something else. Uh, we're not in a position uh, to actually say, look, uh, the state apparatus is behaving like a sort of repressive uh, monolith and it's time it stopped. We're not going to have the capacity to do those things. So that the big uh, hole, if you like, politically for me, is that we're not really properly organising. Thanks. Right.